the Zelda timeline. We're still talking about it because in this episode we are going to be placing where Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are going to fall within the structured Zelda timeline within the Legend of Zelda Encyclopedia. As you can see, the structure is right here on how it's written out. Got descriptions of each timeline individually of what takes place during the events, which I've already talked about that in a prior episode. So if you have not seen the prior episode or not familiar with the Zelda timeline, go check out my previous episode before jumping into this so that way it makes a little bit more sense for you. Or if you have one of these books, study it out real quick and then we'll dive into my theories and thoughts and opinions about where Tears of the Kingdom is placed within the Zelda timeline. So let's get started. Several years have passed since the events of Breath of the Wild, the threat of Calamity Ganon has been destroyed. However, gloom has surfaced into the land of Hyrule, causing people to become sick. Hyrule Kingdom is currently in a state of rebuilding. All the Sheikah tech has been removed and new towers have been built around the kingdom. Link and Zelda begin to investigate the catacombs of Hyrule Castle and find the source of this gloom that is spreading across the land of Hyrule. They enter into an area where it tells the events of what is known as the Imprisoning War, which are events, you know, when you read through the, the timeline that takes place right before A Link to the Past in the timeline where the hero dies in Ocarina of Time. We'll dive into that in just a little bit. Link and Zelda enters the center chamber where a corpse is found with a glowing arm attached to the chest of this corpse where gloom is spewing out of. The glowing arm falls and a secret stone falls before Zelda and Zelda picks up this secret stone. The corpse then begins to reanimate and quickly gloom shoots out towards Link. Link attempts to defend, but shatters the Master Sword in the process and burns up Link's arm. A piece of the sword scrapes the face of the reanimated corpse of Ganondorf. Ganondorf rises up and asks, is that the sword that seals the darkness? He immediately recognizes Link and Zelda, but neither of them recognize him and who this corpse is, which we all know, it's Ganondorf, y'all. It's Ganondorf. The air shakes and Hyrule Castle begins to rise up into the air. Zelda falls and disappears as she travels through time 10,000 years into the past, where the beginning of Hyrule Kingdom has been established and meets the first king, King Raru and Queen Sonya. Raru, a Zonai, and Sonya, a Hylian, Zelda becomes the Sage of Time during this time period. Link awakens on the Sky Islands where the spirit of Raru appears, having attached his own arm to Link, replacing the burnt arm that he has, giving Link special abilities such as Ultra Hand and such. Once Link clears the tutorial area of the Sky Islands and learns about his new abilities, he returns to Hyrule on the surface and reports back to Pura and her team. Zelda has disappeared, but a puppet Zelda is running around the kingdom, causing some confusion. Is this Princess Zelda? What is she doing? What's happening in the kingdom of Hyrule? Four regions are under attack. Monsters have been appearing and returning, and gloom is everywhere. Link investigates each region like before in Breath of the Wild. Takes on new boss fights, teams up with familiar faces and new faces with special abilities. Link explores the depths of the underground areas of Hyrule, explores the Sky Islands, and retrieves tears falling from the Light Dragon, who we find out is actually Princess Zelda. And attached to this Light Dragon is the revived Master Sword, which you learn all this in cutscenes when you collect the Dragon Tears. In the past cutscenes, we see the rise of Ganondorf and what is known as the Imprisoning War. Ganondorf, dubbed as the Demon King, kills Queen Sonya. Raru and all the sages come against Ganondorf, who has become all-powerful at this point. They cannot defeat Ganondorf, but Raru punctures the chest of Ganondorf and immobilizes him and seals him away, costing Raru's life in the process. Zelda, who prepares the future with all the sages, discuss with Minoru, which is Raru's sister, on how to get back to her present time. They discuss the dragonification, which is a forbidden process where you swallow the secret stone to become a dragon that lives on forever. 
which is, again, forbidden. But Zelda decides to go ahead and swallow the secret stone that she has to become a dragon so that way she can regenerate the Master Sword and have the sword ready in time, in the present time where Link is at. Going back to the present day, Link and the Sages confronts Ganondorf in one epic battle. Ganondorf is defeated, but not until he swallows his stone and becomes a dragon himself. In one last fight, Link joins up with the Light Dragon, a.k.a. Zelda, and defeats the Dark Dragon. Raru and Sonya reappears as spirits to help Link revive Zelda back to her former self with Link saving the day. What I gave here is basically a summary of the story just to help set up where we're going to place this timeline. There's so much more to discuss when it comes to Tears of the Kingdom, but we'll leave that for another time. So, without further ado, let's talk about the timeline placement for Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild. Again, there is a lot going on between both games, Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Both games are pretty much one epic adventure. If you think about it in the terms of Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, of course, both of these games are taking place several years from each other. And Breath of the Wild doesn't really give much of a backstory of the timeline placements, but Tears of the Kingdom does, but there are some flaws when talking about the timeline. Breath of the Wild talks about the history of Calamity Ganon and how he reincarnates every so often to eventually giving up on reincarnation and just becoming nothing more but malice and hatred. Tears of the Kingdom gives you more of the history on all how this came about. Of course, when talking about the Zelda timeline, we must keep in mind that these are known as legends. By definition, a Traditional stories sometimes popularly regarded as historical, but unauthenticated. So again, these are legends. So there's going to be some things about each Zelda game when it comes to the timeline that's not going to line up right or make sense. And it's going to be the same thing when we're talking about Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom's placement into the Zelda timeline. Time travel is going to be a major factor when discussing Tears of the Kingdom's placement into the timeline. With Zelda traveling 10,000 years into the past, where she encounters the first king of Hyrule, Raru, a Zonai, and the beginning of Hyrule Kingdom. Tears of the Kingdom's past cutscenes will need to be placed per the Zelda Encyclopedia right after Skyward Sword and right before the Minish Cap. This helps explain the Demon King demises reincarnating hatred and malice that he curses Link and Zelda at the end of Skyward Sword, which leads to a new Demon King in the form of Ganondorf from Tears of the Kingdom. Leading up to Tears of the Kingdom's past story has sealing the Sacred Realm, the Sage Raru builds the Temple of Time and seals the entrance to the Sacred Realm. If we're talking about the same Raru that's in Tears of the Kingdom, that means the Zonai Raru built the Temple of Time. However, in Tears of the Kingdom, there are two Temple of Times. You have one in the Sky Islands, which you go to in the beginning of the game, and then you have the old remains that is on the Great Plateau, which is in the area that basically resembles Ocarina of Time's Castle Town area. So, there's that. So, which Temple of Time did Raru built? Perhaps he built both of them. Maybe he built the one in the Sky Islands prior to building the one on the Great Plateau area, where we first established, you know, the Kingdom of Hyrule, and where potentially the Ocarina of Time Castle Town and Hyrule Castle is placed at. Another point in the encyclopedia before the events is the founding of the Kingdom of Hyrule. Placing Tears of the Kingdom story past before the Minish Cap does make sense mainly for explaining the Four Swords after Minish Cap, because Ganon shows up. The problem, though, is geography. The land of Hyrule is vastly different between games, and this is always going to be a reoccurring problem when talking about the Zelda series, especially when we're trying to piece together the timeline. In Minish Cap, Vadi is a new flavor of the month demon that shows up and is defeated as Link seals him away, 
No master sword to be found in this one. You get the Picori sword in this game. Four Swords, which takes place after Minish Cap, introduces Ganon along with Vadi's revival. This I pointed out in the last video as where did Ganon come from? Where did he show up from? How did Ganon become a thing when Ganondorf was born in Ocarina of Time? Which takes place after. Takes place after. But if you placed Tears of the Kingdom story past between Skyward Sword and Minish Cap, it's very possible for Ganon to emerge through the form of malice and, or gloom pouring out of the corpse of Ganondorf. So that could create this incarnation of Ganon in the Four Swords. But then you have the Hyrulean Civil War and Ocarina of Time issues. Zelda in the Tears of the Kingdom story past who is dubbed as the Sage of Time, unites all the races together and sages to one day pass on the secret stone to new sages in the present day, Tears of the Kingdom, to help Link defeat Ganondorf. The Hyrulean Civil War breaks after four swords, causing conflict among the different races across the land of Hyrule. However, the king then unifies the people under him, so at some point, everyone got ununified, and then they got reunified. That's a mess right there. Ocarina of Time introduces Ganondorf, who is known as the demon thief in this story in the, of the game, and the leader of the Garuda. Like in Tears of the Kingdom, of course, story past, Ganondorf was also the leader of the Garuda during that time as well, but he was known, also known as the Demon King at this time. How can there be two Ganondorfs? Per the story of the Garuda, a male is born every 100 years and is placed as their king. The curse of hatred and malice from demise could have potentially caused a new birth of a second Ganondorf to be reincarnated. To which this incarnation dies at the end of Twilight Princess in the childhood timeline and dies at the end of The Wind Waker in the adult timeline. Double death, y'all, for this incarnation. Double death. Because the timeline splits. Thanks, time travel. But then you get the Imprisoning War issue. An Imprisoning War takes place before A Link to the Past in the Hero of Time Dies timeline. This war erupts in the Sacred Realm, however. The Sages sealed the entrance to the Sacred Realm and Ganon inside of it, all right? And the one in Tears of the Kingdom is in Hyrule to where they sealed Ganondorf with the Raru sacrifice. These two are two separate events, meaning there were two imprisoning wars, especially if you go down the line where the hero dies. You have two histories of two different imprisoning wars. But placing the main story of Tears of the Kingdom, where do you place it? With Tears of the Kingdom story past placement figured, with it being between Skyward Sword and Minish Cap, what about the timeline for Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom? Where does that go? Well, obviously, they're going to go at the very end of the timeline somewhere. That, that's evident. Can it be in the adult timeline? To me, this doesn't work because of the fact that Hyrule was flooded prior to the Wind Waker... And eventually, they establish a brand new kingdom of Hyrule somewhere else. No raw root to be found in this era. So it's not in the adult timeline, but it could be in the child timeline. This would make sense here. And the build-up to Tears of the Kingdom's trailer, I theorize Ganondorf's corpse is the fairy Ganondorf from Twilight Princess due to the damage on his chest. But that is not the case now, since now we know the, the story behind it. That was just one of my theories and trying to figure out, ooh, where does this game take place? There are so many secrets and theories behind all this stuff. But for this timeline to work for just, you know, the present day game portion, Four Swords Adventure has a new incarnation of Ganon. This could be the start of how Calamity Ganon rises. Ganon is sealed away along with Vadi once more. This could be the case because... Ganon could just keep coming back again and again and again until he eventually gives up on reincarnating and becomes Calamity Ganon. However, in the Hero Dies timeline, it could work here too. Ganon is always reincarnating in this timeline. And per Breath of the Wild, at some point, he gives up reincarnating and becomes nothing more than hatred and malice and becomes the form of Calamity Ganon. So either way you look at it, it could work in the Hero Dies timeline. It could work in the Childhood timeline. 
but I don't believe it works in the adult timeline. So where does the game's place? Which timeline? Well, here's some other theories that I've heard. I've heard theories that these two games unifies the timeline back together. And I've also heard that potentially Hyrule Warriors, if you place it in the timeline after all these games, it reunites the timeline. And make it into one linear timeline. Because again, time travel is a thing in the Legend of Zelda series. But it's not considered canon for Hyrule Warriors. But if you do place it in there, you could probably make that argument. But I don't know. I really don't know on that part. Perhaps these are games that creates a reboot for the Legend of Zelda series. They could potentially have a rewritten history or maybe the past story of Tears of Kingdom takes place at the end of all these timelines to unite all the timelines together. It's a very high possibility. Until N Nintendo officially states, all we can do is just simply give our thoughts, our opinions, and theories on the timeline placement for Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. And that's the reason why I love the Legend of Zelda series. It's because it's open for interpretation. It's open for debate. It's open to talk about how do these games all fit together. Because again, the word legend is in the title of these games and it's unauthenticated. So there's that. So my love for the Legend of Zelda series, you know, the games, the adventures, everything about it, it is so great. It is awesome. It's a phenomenal story. And picking up one of these books to understand more in depths of the games, you know, between this and Hyrule Historia, it's a great time and it's a great adventure. And the Legend of Zelda series will always be my favorite franchise of all time. Right there next to Sonic the Hedgehog, of course. But if we ever did a timeline theory on that one, God help us all. I think it's a lot worse than the Legend of Zelda series when it comes to Sonic the Hedgehog. But maybe I'll take the challenge on that later on down the road. But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, that is where I'm going to leave it off at. It is open for interpretation. You decide, ladies and gentlemen, is it in the childhood timeline? Is it in the hero dies timeline? Maybe you can make the case argument that no, it takes place in the adult timeline. Or maybe you're in the camp of a unified timeline or maybe just a complete reboot altogether. Whichever it is for you, you do you. When it comes to the story, of the Legend of Zelda. But with that being said, thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe out there and take care.